Hey everyone, so I'm Phil Albertelli and this is The Week in Doubt and th just wanted to remind you and this one m might be a little outside the usual wheelhouse of the show and I seem to be saying that more and more lately but I guess you could say in a sense that it is related to the topic of spirituality that's the rationale I'm going with anyway and certainly it wouldn't be the first time I've discussed psychedelics on the show. So it looks like Massachusetts, my home state, is considering decriminalizing psilocybin mushrooms, or at least that's what some lawmakers are pushing for. And according to a Boston Herald article I'm about to read from, some communities in the state have essentially already decriminalized mushrooms. And so, once again, this article is from the Boston Herald. It's by someone named Chris Van Buskirk, I think it is. And it was originally published on June 10th, so a while ago, and it was updated on June 13th. And it's entitled, Decriminalize Magic Mushrooms, Say Democrats, Who Have Filed Bills to Loosen Psilocybin Law in Massachusetts. And then the subheading reads, State Legislature's Judiciary Committee Holding Tuesday Hearing on Proposal. And so, once again, this article is a couple of weeks old, so the Tuesday in question has already come and gone, and as of yet, I've been unable to find any updates regarding what the results of the aforementioned hearing were. But let's continue. Any person 18 years or older could grow, eat, or share magic mushrooms under legislation pending on Beacon Hill that supporters say will offer residents another option to treat mental health and addiction disorders. Six communities in Massachusetts have already directed their police departments to not make arrests for possession of psilocybin, a move that effectively decriminalizes the use of the drug. Advocates now argue the lawmakers should pass bills from a pair of Democrats that decriminalize so-called magic mushrooms on a statewide level. And here's a quote, It's ridiculous that a plant medicine we've been using for tens of thousands of years that grows straight from the ground, that has the lowest harms of any controlled substance, far less than alcohol and cigarettes that we buy at corner stores, is not available to people who could really benefit, said James Davis, a former Beacon Hill staffer who now runs Bay Staters for Natural Medicine. Representatives Lindsay Sabadosa and Senator Pat Jellin, I think it is, filed bills that decriminalize possession, ingestion, obtaining, growing, giving away, in quotes, without financial gain, give me some, to people 18 years and older, and transportation of up to two grams of psilocybin, psilocin, I think it is, dimethyltryptamine, ibogaine, and mescaline. The proposals are scheduled for a Tuesday hearing in front of the Judiciary Committee, which is chaired by two Democrats, Senator Jamie Eldridge and Representative Michael Day. Psilocybin, and I often hear people say psilocybin, and I say psilocybin often, but I looked it up and apparently the proper pronunciation is psilocybin, but it might be a tomato-tomato, Nietzsche, Nietzsche type of thing. Anyway, psilocybin is the chemical commonly found in magic mushrooms. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration granted quote-unquote breakthrough status to psilocybin in 2017 and has since approved applications for companies to investigate its use in treating various disorders. Somerville, I used to live in Somerville, Cambridge, Northampton, East Hampton, Amherst, and Salem are the communities in Massachusetts that have directed their police to not make arrests related to psilocybin or psilocybin. Former city councilor William Dwight and councilor Rachel Maiori, I think it is, proposed the resolution in Northampton on psilocybin mushrooms, arguing the use of the substance helps people with post-traumatic stress disorder, chronic depression, cluster headaches, and substance abuse. And here's a quote, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to a resurgence of heroin... <laughs> 
please don't demonetize me, YouTube. Anyway, uh, we got COVID, we got heroin, um, the COVID, and now, now I'm saying it again, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to a resurgence of heroin and opioid overdose, deaths and severe depression in Massachusetts communities, two ailments that entheogenic plants have been shown to have particularly strong utility in treating. According to published peer-reviewed medical research, the two city lawmakers wrote in their success resolution. Sabadosa, a Democrat from Northampton, said being able to turn back to the local debate really does help when putting together legislation at the State House. And the idea for the bill, she said, came from constituents who pitched her on the proposal during a meeting at a coffee shop. Just hanging around a coffee shop talking about hallucinogens. All right. Um, sounds like a weird dream. But here's another quote. Their stories resonated with me because what they were telling me was that they were looking for what is effectively a harm reduction bill. It'll decriminalize. It doesn't legalize, she told the Herald. I believe very strongly in this idea of decriminalizing and making things safer for people. Colorado voted to legalize psilocybin in 2022, and Oregon was the first state to allow adults to use the drug after a successful ballot measure passed in 2020. Davis said legalization in Massachusetts would reduce the stigma that surrounds research scholars from studying the effects of the drug. Adults found growing magic mushrooms could face up to 10 years in prison, according to the Bay State for Natural Medicine. That is absolutely draconian. And here's a final, uh, a final quote. The state law is really necessary to back up the community power, and a lot of police already privately don't enforce laws against psilocybin or psilocybin mushrooms. It does happen, Davis said, and some people have their lives destroyed by those arrests. And that's actually the end of the article. Hopefully everyone's still awake. Uh, I found it to be extremely interesting, which is why I picked it and decided to read it on the show. But I just hope my delivery wasn't too dry or overly boring. And so as you can probably tell, I'm all for this. I've long been fascinated by psychedelics for a number of reasons. On the one hand, I'm just fascinated by consciousness and the fact that by simply ingesting certain substances, we can profoundly alter consciousness, and what those altered states can teach us about ourselves, and how they can shift our perspective on existence or reality. Uh, when I was younger, I used to be really into Huxley's The Doors of Perception. I used to read Timothy Leary and Terence McKenna. And then as someone who's long wrestled with conditions like depression, anxiety, migraines, I'm also deeply interested in the potential therapeutic benefits of psychedelics. I say potential, but as the story touched on, we already know that certain psychedelics can help people with things like PTSD, depression, anxiety, and they've even been shown to help alleviate death anxiety in the terminally ill and people nearing the end and not to get overly morbid. And on a side note, I believe MDMA has also been shown to be beneficial in therapeutic settings as well. And although MDMA is sometimes described as having psychedelic properties, in my mind I don't categorize it with the likes of lysergic acid or psilocybin, uh, but I can definitely see how it could be therapeutic in its own right. And I feel like I have a responsibility when talking about something like this to mention or point out the potential dangers or downsides. I remember when I first started working for my family's construction or general contracting business, one of the first things my father ever taught me, and it really stuck with me, is to, in regard to handling dangerous power tools, always respect your tools and always keep in mind the damage they can cause if you're not careful or they're not being wielded properly. A long time ago, a friend of one of my older brothers was working for my father, and he absentmindedly rested a skill saw or circular saw on his thigh before the blade stopped, and it wasn't pretty. And whenever I'm using a table saw, I always keep in mind those stories of people who have lost fingers uh, while not being careful enough. 
and I think it's similar with psychedelics. When used properly, they can be a tool for personal insight and growth, but when used irresponsibly, you can potentially find yourself in a bad situation. As far as I know, psychedelics like psilocybin or psilocybin, I believe the article touched on this as well, and lysergic acid are, physically speaking, very safe. They're not like some hard drug that's going to stop your heart or cause an overdose. I have read that very rarely. I guess there can be uh, mushroom overdoses, but uh, they're not life-threatening. And uh, I imagine it's more because of the psychological effects than the physical effects. And the people are usually released shortly after. Because, uh, yeah, the, the physical effects of these substances are pretty mild. The danger with psychedelics is really the potential negative psychological effects, the dreaded quote-unquote bad trip, which could lead to heightened anxiety, panic attacks, paranoia, um, and, and I've been there, you know, where you might feel like you're going to die, but you're not actually. It's just a negative state that you have to endure until it either passes or you work your way out of it. And anyone who has any kind of experience with these substances will tell you the same thing. Setting who you're with and your mental and emotional state going in make all the difference. They tend to amplify mood and mental states. So if you take mushrooms, for instance, and you're in a bad headspace going in, and maybe you're surrounded by the wrong people, or you're somewhere unfamiliar, you can end up having a bad trip. Whereas if you're in a pleasant or safe environment with people you really trust and feel comfortable with, it could end up being one of the best experiences of your life. For me personally, and I haven't done shroom since my 20s, I tended to have these kinds of uh, roller coaster trips or experiences where I'd be waiting for the effect to kick in, and eventually I'd feel some kind of strange, mild high creeping on, and then eventually they, you know, they'd really kick in, and I might find myself having a bad trip that I had to work through. And eventually I would work through the negativity or paranoia and enter into or break through into this really positive, almost sublime state. And I almost forgot to touch on or mention the concept of ego death. It reminds me of Buddhism or Eastern philosophy or religion, where the goal is to attain a state of oneness and let go of the ego. And I feel like psychedelics really do induce this kind of dissolution of the ego. And if you're not ready for it, it can be horrifying. You can feel like you've lost your sense of self and be, you know, and you can become over overwhelmed by anxiety, but if you are ready and you're in the right headspace, this dissolution of the ego or ego death can be something beatific or blissful and full of personal insight. I remember one time I was hanging out with this friend who was kind of moody and unpredictable, definitely had his issues. He could be a, a great friend one moment, praising you, talking about how much fun he was having hanging out, and then all of a sudden be negative, passive aggressive. And we were hanging out in his parents' basement, I think, and he offered me mushrooms, which we both took. And he then suddenly decided he was bored and he wanted to go into the city to hang out with some friends he had made who were apparently in a gang, I believe he said. And that wouldn't have appealed to me, even if, you know, when I was sober, never mind on mushrooms. And I had enough sense to say I didn't want to go. But he was being passive aggressive and, dare I say, kind of prickish and had his mind set on going whether I went or not. So he basically gave me mushrooms and screwed. Not the first time, sadly, that it happened to me. I had this uh, other friend offer me mushrooms out of nowhere while we were at some kind of party up at Hampton Beach where friends had rented a beach house, appropriately enough. He suddenly decided he was taking off, and I was left in the middle of this crowded party in this strange, claustrophobic environment. 
and I had a really bad trip that I had to work my way out of. I had this female friend who had had way too much to drink, so I looked after her and just focusing on something positive and taking care of someone else helped me enter a more positive phase of the trip. But that time that my passive-aggressive friend, as I characterized him earlier, abandoned me to go hang out with his gang friends or whatever they were, uh, because he was also something of a habitual liar, and uh, I say that more as a point of fact, I'm not trying to disparage the person, a long time ago, probably while I was still in my early 20s, I consciously made an effort to not talk about people when they weren't around, because that was a bad habit I had when I was younger, and it never leads to any good. It, it, it makes you feel bad and guilty for talking about someone. And if they find out, obviously, uh, they're not going to feel good about it. It's going to cause conflict and drama. But uh, he was kind of a habitual or chronic liar uh, and kind of a, an unpredictable person. So much so that I made a decision to cut ties. And actually, one of the things that, I mean, one of the straws that really broke the camel's back is... Don't tell, uh, don't tell my family. Hopefully no one's listening. But when I was young, maybe I was like 19 or something like that, my parents went away and I had a bunch of friends over. And when I wasn't in the living room, my older brother, and I was kind of shocked he didn't do anything. I have two older brothers. Um, they didn't let me know until after the fact this kind of unhinged, unpredictable friend took the family dog, who is a little Yorkshire Terrier who is wearing a harness and a leash, and he picked him up by the leash and spun him around to the point where the dog was off the ground. And as an animal lover, especially when it comes to my own pets, my friend came looking for me after the fact. He didn't know I knew, and I was at work, and I'm usually a very agreeable person, but I was pissed, and I let him know I was pissed. And that was pretty much the point where I broke off the friendship. And I'm not sure, you know, when you're looking back through the haze of, of history or memory and trying to remember the order of things, but I think after that, after I cut, you know, cut ties, we may have hung out a couple of more times down the road, probably when I was somewhere in my early 20s, and it may have been during one of those times that we reconnected where this episode where he gave me mushrooms and took off took place. But after he took off, I ended up walking home as the trip was slowly kicking in. I got home and sat in my room and started having a bad trip. I was really into world music at the time, and I had this cassette of an Indian chant that was supposed to kind of evoke a spirit of compassion, I think, and it was related to the Hindu goddess Kali, who is often um, perceived as a goddess of destruction. But in many traditions, different deities have different facets of their being. Uh, they can have positive and negative aspects, etc. But I think even Kali's role as a kind of destroyer, as a destructive force, is viewed as a positive thing because it precedes renewal, you know? So, but anyway, uh, I believe it was, the chant was called Kali Durga or Kali Durge or something like that. And I actually found this online at a site called siddhayoga.org, I think. And it talks about this chant. And so it says in this Nama Sankirtana, I think it is, when we invoke the goddess by reverently saluting her, Kali Durga or Durje Namo Nama, I'm probably butchering that, but that is the exact chant, I remember it well. We celebrate the liberating power of the Supreme Shakti, saluting her in her forms as the warrior goddesses Kali and Durga. This chant is set in the Mandraga, whose characteristic melodic turns often appear in devotional songs and dances of North India. This raga conveys the rasas, I think it is, or qualities of love and lightheartedness. 
And for anyone who's new to the show, I'm essentially a skeptic and agnostic atheist, but I'm also something of a, of a seeker, and uh, I've always had a soft spot for Eastern philosophy and spirituality, uh, even more so probably when I, I mean, I still have it, but I was more actively engaged with Eastern philosophy and spirituality when I was younger. And I was trying to see if I could find the exact rendition that I had back then that I actually listened to to help work my way through this bad trip. I can't find the exact rendition. I, I found some more like modernized versions that I don't like. I like the traditional Indian music. This is probably the closest I could find. And I'm just going to play it through the speakers on my computer. Wait a second. <laughs> All of the sudden, I remembered that recently I was going through folders on my computer and I found one labeled cassette transfers probably two years ago or so. I took a bunch of old cassettes. I bought a little device that let me transfer the recordings onto my computer and save them as audio digital audio files and I threw out the physical cassettes and sure enough there's an audio file labeled Kali I believe it's Durge Kali Durge D U R G E and uh so I have the actual recording Yeah, so there it is, and hopefully I don't get nabbed uh, with a copyright claim. But yeah, I, th I find it very moving. There's a very kind of tender, soothing uh, quality to the melody. And it's about probably over 40 minutes long, and I had a cassette deck that would just, you know, flip sides and... and play the alternate side when it came to the end of, of one side. And so I let it play over and over again while I wrote in a notebook trying to work through the negativity I was experiencing. And eventually I had this kind of breakthrough and it was probably one of the best experiences of my life. I felt like I was reborn if that doesn't sound too uh, over the top. And I think it's safe to say that I'm high in neuroticism. I kind of live in my own head, and I was like that even back in the day. And I could be really hard on myself. And all of a sudden, it was like I was fully in the present. Like I had just come into the world and had let go of all my baggage. I looked at myself in the mirror, and I had all this acceptance and compassion for myself. And I almost laughed at how needlessly hard on myself I had been. It was pretty amazing. I could definitely use something like that now. <laughs> um, my days of just popping whatever someone puts in front of me are pretty much over, but I would love to take psychedelics, namely uh, psilocybin or psilocybin, responsibly in a therapeutic context. I was worried that antidepressants might interfere with the, uh, the shrooms. I'm currently on Lexapro, and I know some people will actually take a so-called drug holiday where they temporarily take a break from their antidepressants so they can take psychedelics. But I found at least one article recently, uh, a study that suggested that not only would Lexapro not interfere with the efficacy of the psilocybin, but that it seems to allow the positive aspects of the drug while supposedly deterring or reducing the negative aspects, the anxiety and paranoia associated with a bad trip, etc. And that was just one study or article, not sure how accurate or valid it is. But if that's true, hot damn, imagine being able to enjoy shrooms while being shielded from bad trips. And once again, this story is a week or two old, and as of yet, as I mentioned earlier, I haven't heard any updates on the proposed bills. But the fact that there's already six Massachusetts communities that have uh, essentially decriminalized psilocybin mushrooms is certainly encouraging. 
And uh, I think that's about all I have to say on the topic, and that will conclude this week's episode. And I know I'm I'm off of the regular schedule. I usually like to release an episode over the weekend, and here it is almost Wednesday. I'm doing my best. Uh, but you guys know the drill. Uh, as always, thanks for listening. You can like the Facebook page. You can follow the show on Twitter, even though I'm not on there much. You can check out the YouTube channel. Maybe you're doing that now. If you'd like to support the show monetarily, which is always greatly appreciated, you can go to patreon.com com slash the week in doubt and support what I do here for as little as 99 cents a month. All right, brothers and sisters, until next time.